See, that one's <sighs> Doesn't really make much of a difference, even with the lights on. Jesus Christ. I put this here. Maybe a little bit, not much difference though, still. Oy, oy, oy. It's me. Are you talking to me, Case? Yes. It says Lauren Bronstein. Oh, because you're in my account. Oh. Oh, you're recording this ready? I, I thought I didn't realize we were recording to start. No, I'll exit it that way that we can just join. We can, uh, does it say recording? It says the recording, right? Yeah. I mean, you can say, yours does say Lauren Bronstein because you're in my account. That's okay. I'll, uh, okay. I, I, I don't care, but, uh, I'm afraid if you change on yours without logging out, it may change it on mine too. But if you can stay there, if as long as you don't care, it's fine. I mean, I don't care what it says, but I'll, I'll log out and I'll change it. Hold on. It's all the same. Uh, I'm just, I'm recording. Okay. It's okay. King praise.
So the reason why I'm recording is because there's something that happens psychologically for trained professionals like yourself, where when you say, okay, you ready? We're going to start in three, two, you still sort of, you, you, you ease into it instead of just being natural. Okay. So now it says me, it shows live transcripts. Do I still have, you're the host. Yeah. I believe so. Uh, well, how would I know from the host? It would probably say it somewhere. Is the lighting okay? Because it's not, uh, I normally use daylight, but because it's so late now, it's. I think you're fine. I'm, I'm, I'm sending John the link. Excellent. Ah, so you should join any second. I just jumped out of the shower. Well, I appreciate you setting this up. It's very exciting, man. First guest, man. This is a big deal. I mean, we is should it? say it when he comes on to get them all excited. Oh, yeah. I was watching some of his clips. It's, uh, it's fun. He's a funny guy, dude. I, I We'll talk more about it, but I, I met him working at uh, the YouTube channel. The, uh, the, the one you were doing before, Inform Overload? Yeah. He was working there as well? Yeah, he, he managed it when Charlotte left. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about all that stuff. Ah. Can you hear? I have the fan on next to me. Can you hear it? Can I turn it up? No, no, I think you're okay. Right, I'm still a little sweaty. I'm sweaty. I mean, I just showered, but I'm just like hot. I got to cool down. Yeah. That's fun. You think you'll be able yeah, to get JJ on before uh, he goes away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll get on hopefully sooner or later. This month has just been fucking crazy for us work-wise. For sure. Are you going to do more work with the Jack Links? I don't know. That was a one-off. Um, I was kind of hoping that would be an in with them. They haven't reached out, so I don't know. Did you... Ha they were happy with the work yeah very happy so they told you that yeah they said your, your energy was amazing both of you guys excellent so maybe it doesn't hurt to reach out to them i feel like a lot of opportunities present themselves when you're, when you're a little more uh eager yeah what's up man hey what's going on boys hey what's up? lauren nice to meet you yet? nice to finally meet you <laughs> i've heard so much about you virtually um, oh i hope i understand we we were saying that uh, you're the first guest on the show. So, hey, was I the first Happy guest on your podcast? You were one of the first guests, I believe. Patrick was my first guest. There, right. you were really, you were really early on. You're like, okay, whatever. You're yeah, trendsetter. Right, then, then fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get a ring light. You guys, it's amazing how much more professional your uh, your screens are compared to mine. Like I'm, I normally rely on daylight, but we're doing it so late now, so I can really see the disadvantages. I just have like a, I have like a box light. I don't even have a ring light. You know what you need to do, Lauren, is go to the uh, video options, the little arrow. Click on video settings, mm. and under video, just check off adjust for low light. Ooh. Even with my lights on, I, yeah. I still have that option on to take care of. Because if I turn it off, you can see it gets oh. darker. Yeah, look at mine change. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah, settings adjust for the light. It's, I see. it's like a little bit of a hack so that you actually don't have to have that many lights yeah, set up. Smooths Jeez, out my skin that too. It's like a filter for Instagram. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can smooth Much your better. skin out. <laughs> cool. Jared, so, you were the third guest on my show. That's what it was. Third guest. Hey, save. What's I was what the first it? guest. <laughs> it was you did the first one by there. yourself? I just did the solo podcast for the first one. How was that? What was that like? Um, it, interesting. I think I went for like 30 minutes. I, I took an approach where I like actually wrote like a, a script for the show, kind of like loose script slash like things I wanted to talk about. And then after editing it, I was like, you know, this would be so much better if it was just like an interview podcast where I'm just like shooting the shit. I did another solo podcast where I just did like 50 facts about me. And again, it was not script reading. Like it was just like looking at uh, this previous list that I had written and kind of riffing off of the points that I had put on the list. But they're fun. I mean, all I do is talk by myself on stage, right? So it's pretty similar. What made you want to start a podcast? Um, it's a way to, it's a better way, I think, to advertise yourself to people in terms of like being a stand-up comedian, like on my podcast, for example, I can like promote dates and stuff that I have coming up for people to see. And what I really noticed was I listened to so many podcasts that I was like, I feel like I know these guys or girls or whoever I'm listening to. And it was because you listen to them every single day. And I'm like, oh, I need to do that for people who are perhaps a fan of me. 
they, they don't know me. They only know what you show them, right? So I'm like, what a better way than to like, ha and it's an excuse to hang with my friends and catch up with them and like, and, and let my audience know more about me. It's certainly an intimate uh, setting, podcasting. That's why I think it's so popular because very, I mean, before podcasting existed, everything was so curated, interviews with like Barbara Walters or Larry King. So to have like a three hour conversation, you really deep dive in the things that aren't, I mean, I don't know, at least when I watch like Fallon or that stuff, it seems so scripted that it's just, I don't enjoy it. So it almost seems like acting. Yeah. And he's talking to people that he doesn't really care to talk to. He's right. just talking yeah. to somebody that has something to promote. That's it. Yeah. Right. Always. It's always, all right. So you're promoting this new album. Yeah. Uh, here it is. Going to perform the hit single. And it's like, okay. It's yeah, so no, awkward. podcasts are, are definitely much more personal. Like it's, it's not to say I, I wouldn't have guests on that I'm not friends with, but at least to start, like, you know, I'm having you on. I want to have JJ on. I would love to have Sean and Patrick on. Like, people that I talk to you know what I mean I don't want to have yeah. random and eventually sure like it'd be interesting to kind of I guess get to know people over a podcast but I feel like it's the banter is better if you know them and there's some sort of background there um but funny you say you know a way for people to know you like I feel like people only knew me as like Jared on IO or like Jared from top 10 and then they hear the stuff that I say on here and they're just like, oh, I didn't realize he's like that. And it's like, this is really me. Like, yeah, that was yeah. <laughs> very filtered me. You know what I mean? Um, and edited. Yeah. Like, heavily edited. Yeah. Version of you too. No, like, I, I, so, like, obviously, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this, but we pre-record some of the podcasts. And I was, like, weeks late to post mine. I went, like, a 10 days without posting one. So I posted ours, I think it was episode five the other day. And my buddy messaged me. And he was just, like, I'm watching the podcast, dude. And he's, like, I'm laughing so hard when you were talking about the HPV vaccine and when your brother's like, why'd you get it? And you said, cause my face makes a good stool. Or so I said something like that. And I was like, I said that. <laughs> like, <laughs> you really surprise yourself. Right. But it's like, that's the shit that people like, I would never say anything like that on the YouTube channels, man. And it's like, that's just my comedy. That's my humor. But again, it was very like filtered and edited. And even when we made those jokes, it was edited out because YouTube yeah. very like, yeah you know even before you started like writing you had in your head and on an actual working document a list of words that we could not say and topics Ridiculous. that we could not talk about and i was like oh it just makes me want to talk about them more <laughs> yeah that's stifles creativity that's unfortunate yeah. i didn't know that was the case and it's and it's like that's just the game of youtube and like unless unless obviously you make money solely off sponsorships but if you're trying to get ad revenue you know I, I would do videos about like World War II, but I couldn't say the word Hitler. <laughs> Actually, though, like, yeah, they would oh, wow. Nazi, they demonetize it, and I'm like, is this not like, are we trying to erase like history? Anti-Semitic right protectionists. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know, what kind it. of grand conspiracy is going on here? Yeah. What do you mean? So it's like, yeah, it's it's the rules are on YouTube at least, and again, it's Google, and you know, it's changed over a couple of years, but it it really is astonishing. The things that people who aren't in the business but aren't aware of you know what i mean yeah because you like I, it's the same thing with the podcast you only see what's put out and like i have a show coming up july 13th at ottawa yuck yucks if anyone wants to go check that out um but people don't know that unless you say it or you message people and say hey i got yeah. a show going because people everybody's in their own world in their own life but i also think the censorship thing at where we worked was a bit bullshit because it was mostly because they want to be able to say, I think, to their sponsors that they're like a for kids like channel. Like, right. oh, we hit all ages, so we don't talk about like the controversial topics or whatever. Because right. I've seen people like do horrible content on YouTube and it's monetized. Well, it's like, you got like, like what's her name? Ailey Sarin or something like that. Canadian YouTuber. She does like, she talks, I think, true crime while doing her makeup and she's huge. Yeah. But like, the, and the true crime thing is huge. And again, I haven't watched much of her stuff, so maybe she's a bad example to use. But it's like, I've seen videos, maybe not of her, but of other people being like, you know, yeah, so like doing their makeup. They're like, yeah, so they would like slit his throat and then like drink his blood and then harvest his organs. And I'm like, how the fuck is that okay? <laughs> like, what yeah. I don't understand what's going on here. So, yeah, I think, um, I think to your point, you know, they played it a little like extra safe just to say they could hit all ages, but still man it's like you know not to sound like a not to sound like a republican but like the censorship <laughs> on some of these websites is, is extreme like it's really a lot wouldn't that be the opposite though it wouldn't republicans want censorship 
No, I mean, you, hey, he's living in, you're living in the past there, Lauren. Yeah, it, 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 it flipped. That was the case. That was the case. You're not wrong. There was a point in time where Republicans were like, I can't believe the music that these people are right. singing. Rap artists like Eminem, they need to be banned from our cities. They're corrupting the children. And then it flipped to left wing people being like, I can't believe these people are saying these things online. They need to be blocked and removed from yeah. platforms. It's like, wait, did y'all did y'all Freaky Friday right now? <laughs> no, literally though, it's like what like I I look. I don't necessarily agree with everything Trump said, but the fact that he got banned off of Twitter, it's like people could just block him. <laughs> yeah, but Twitter is like an example of this. Is the problem with these social media websites is that they they're the uh the conduit where everybody goes to have a conversation but they're they're run by like hardcore uh, liberal-minded hippies from silicon valley right they've always like sort of had those ideologies from this before they even started it uh so and i don't think jack dorsey's personally responsible but they've always sort of leaned in that direction so for sure now that they have this power though this platform that everybody relies on like it's unfortunate that you you say go somewhere else but there really isn't anywhere else People open up new platforms, but it's not like Twitter. It doesn't have the yeah, I mean, relevance of Twitter. There is, there's, they called it the alt right uh, rumble. Is that what it was? Rumble? Oh, I, mean, yeah. it's like an right app. I don't, I, that shit to me has like, it, it's the uh, biggest like trick. It's the biggest honey pot from like the CIA ever. Yeah. Like, hey, all of you right wingers, everybody <laughs> yeah. go to this yeah. platform. Let's go talk yeah. about storming the Capitol on this website all together. Okay, so we can easily track you in one site. Holy have you shit, have you ever man. heard of the dead internet theory no what's that oh my no. god so this is uh, this fascinating theory that i just learned about so they were basically they were talking about how like when the internet started it was like alive like you there was like chat rooms happening like on all of these different servers and like there was all of these different websites that we would go to like hundreds of different websites that you would go to right like you'd have to bookmark them to remember oh that was a cool website and now we've kind of arrived at like what you were saying the same like four social media platforms and we just kind of like cycle through those same platforms again and again and again we never really visit like another part of the internet even though it's still there and then on top of that because those social media platforms made it like there's an um people are incentivized to want to like up their follower account because of the dopamine hits and like because of all of that they're addicted to like the likes and stuff so because of that then you have bots that come into play people who buy followers and, and up their follower account with bots so now you have all of these bots like just they used to be able to track like there's a million people on the internet now they don't know they don't actually even know what percentage of people on the internet are real and what's a bot because the internet's been flooded with so many bots. Like you see them in the comment section of almost every Instagram page. Now. Yeah. There's like a thousand people that are like, don't look at my stories. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, this isn't a real person. They have four photos and 9,000 followers. And you're like, what the fuck? Is that the, tur- so- the Turing test? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I was is is that's it called the Turing test where it's like the, he, the theory was that there's going to become a point where artificial intelligence is so good that it's going to be indistinguishable like to the average person to be able to differentiate whether it actually is a robot or not? It's going to get to that. Like those, those two things are going to collide at the same time. Like the internet well, is going to be so overwhelmed that you're not going to know the difference between is this a real person posting these photos or is this just some bot? And it's, it's actually 20 people that are converging on this one account and making these posts. And it's dangerous because the people, I mean, a lot of people get their narratives from online, like the majority at this point. So like you could, I mean, people talk about this, God, we're being a dead horse, but you know, like the Russia, I guess, right. They're pushing certain stories, but it's like, it's like, it's the truth. Like uh, supposedly they had more of a uh, effect on the election than people think, because a lot of people get their news from Twitter. So if they're yeah. pushing specific stories, exposing things, whether it's true or not, doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And even if they recount the story, half the people aren't going to see that. So they're just going to believe this fact. I mean, one of the craziest thing was, I think it was like they got caught. It was like a bunch of essentially like teenagers in Macedonia that were like making, they they had like meme factories where they just made memes (laughs) and shit. And uh, there was a couple of these different agencies who made let's say it's like a Facebook page that's like golden retrievers. And you're like, oh, I like golden retrievers. And they're posting all this golden retriever content and you like it. And now the golden retriever page on Facebook has 7 million followers. 
overnight, one of these pages just switches to Hillary Clinton is a criminal or Donald <laughs> or Donald. It just switches and deletes right. all the content. And now they have 7 million people that they can broadcast whatever they want right. out to them. Right. So what they would do is they would then start feeding that narrative, whichever narrative they chose, whether Donald Trump is an asshole or Hillary Clinton is a criminal, right? Start pushing those narratives out. People are getting angry. And then they would host events right across the street from each other. So they'd be like, hey, everybody, we're going to meet up for the Hillary Clinton is awesome party at this address. And then on the Trump page, hey, everybody, we're going to meet at the Donald Trump is awesome party on this side of the street. And they would come at the same time and inevitably a, like a fight would happen. Because people show up and they're like, I have been told to hate you. So I see you and I hate you. Like, it's literally what you're saying. It happened. It's been put to test. Like, it's absolutely insane that more people aren't talking about it. The danger to, like, is the way it, these social media platforms operate. And uh, when you're on Facebook, especially people that are, like, older or parents, maybe, this generation, they're not maybe going directly to the golden retriever page to recognize, oh, this whole entire thing has been changed to Hillary Clinton. So they're just scrolling through their feed and it just seamlessly comes up mm -hmm. one or two posts. And they, might, they may not even realize this is from the golden retriever page. You may be because you're more cognizant when searching. So it's almost like there's, it's almost like it's um, subliminally in a way or subtly uh, feeding you that information. So what, what the, just to play a uh, devil's advocate, what's the purpose of setting up opposing groups on the same street oh it, for me it always goes back to well, obviously there's something and then we're gonna go really deep conspiracy <laughs> here but anytime i see like in group fighting i think oh there's something bigger that's going on that they don't want us to be looking at right now i see that's always where i go to because money runs everything we know that if you follow the money it will lead you right back to what the motivating factor was to get that like thing done right like always the case and it it just it, the timing of things just seems too convenient like the roe v wade thing happens right as Ghislaine maxwell is being sentenced to 20 years in prison I but no names that, are coming and out no one talks about it no names are coming out either. Like name names. We want to know who these powerful people are that she helped have sex with underage women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a pretty serious crime, but they know it would fucking crumble like hierarchies. It would just crumble everything, right? Like right. you'd have royal family members being like blasted in the news and yeah. like- I think you mentioned it, a name earlier too that'd probably be involved. <laughs> <laughs> talking about Clinton? <laughs> This maybe man like 26 uh, times i don't know oh uh, seems like a lot alex jones at all i i didn't say it but if lauren if you go here and there for like for a few weeks i think we'll know why no oh, you're so funny there there was this crazy thing that happened with uh somebody who actually i was listening to a podcast where they were like because i love listening to i find myself very middle of the aisle when it comes to politics like i think both sides are absolutely just bad shit. like i don't i have a i have a problem like siding with either of them on anything so even like in my podcast i'll listen to like let's say ezra miller or somebody like very left wing and then i'll listen to someone as crazy on the right wing like stephen crowder for example and uh, on one podcast, they were like, let's check all of the addresses on the voter ballots, because that was when they were all gung ho about how Trump does election was stolen. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then I kind of went, huh, because they pulled up an address and they went there and it was like on this, it was like the side of a highway, like it wasn't even an actual address. <laughs> and then they looked into who this person was. And she was like a former employee of Clinton. And I was like, okay, either this is like some crazy conspiracy that the Clintons covered up or it's Steven Crowder trying to make good YouTube content. You know what I mean? Right. For his mm -hmm. audience, because what would be better content for his audience than some crazy conspiracy like that, that he magically was able to- I have all people, he's the one that break the story. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody figured this out before him. Like it, so it's, again, it's, that's why I'm like, Mm, this feels gross. Like, I don't know what's yes. going on here, but it's like, it's gross. A lot of it seems uh, tribalistic unless, uh, okay, a lot of it seems self-aggrandizing and more about winning than doing good mm -hmm. for the for the people or groups of people. It seems more like just like we, we just, it's almost like they want to win. Like it's a sports game. Yeah. I want my team to win. That's, and, and it sounds so dismissive to say that, but just based on the way they, 
they uh, the things they say, the things they fight on, the hills they die on sometimes doesn't always it's they seem too educated to really believe sometimes yeah. the things they say. Again, I think it's like the powerful elite just like playing on that like they right. know that we are like tribal they know there's literally like advertising companies are have psychologists as part of their advertising team yep. to figure out how they can tap into here to get us to keep buying right i heard i read something crazy where it was like your computer will monitor like your mouse movement and they can tell even on your mouse movement if you are more likely to develop like like something like arthritis or if you're going to have a stroke or because right. it's like all based on how sporadic your mouse moves. Also, if you're on a Facebook post and you hover over that post for a little bit, they know that you're interested in it. And, and then you, so like, they'll recommend you shit like that. Like it's, it's little, crazy. it's little, little, little shit that we don't even think about that they know everything about. And it's, See, scary. but I think that goes back to Lauren, what you were saying of like AI becoming more intelligent than we are. We don't even realize these, minor things that's happening in our day-to-day -day lives that's kind of shaping not to say our outlook but what we see and what we digest on a day-to-day -day basis and we're not even aware of it consciously because of these i guess yeah. you could say algorithms or, or, or whatever you want to call it but um i don't know if you read atomic habits lauren you did right yeah so in atomic habits i listened to the audiobook he talked about how companies literally hire like professionals to get the perfect like crunch in a chip and like yeah. the perfect amount of of you know salt and vinegar and this and that and it's like things that you don't think matter at all but it, like they said like with the oreo like it's the perfect amount of of like filling so your taste buds enjoy it more so you crave more so you buy more and like when i heard that i was like there's so much going on that we just are not aware of like this is some crazy shit I know it does sound very conspiracy, but like no, it's it's food science, food scientists. Mm -hmm. Like it's a job. It's a thing. Yeah, and it's like who, like who would think about that? But I think it's you know, <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting to learn about, like in school more so than being forced to learn about biology when I want to be an actor. Like what the fuck yeah. do I got to learn biology for? <laughs> you know so you mean? know where where to vote on Roe versus Wade. That's why you need to know biology. Yeah, yeah that's fair. I guess yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> We hope, we hope. <laughs> but no, going, man, going back to what you said about like being in the middle, it's like, it's unbelievable how each side flips the narrative based on like the vaccine. One side was like my body, my choice. <laughs> and then Roe versus Wade, this, the same side that said that is like, no, 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 you can't do that. It's we decide what you do. And it's like, oh, don't get me started. I, just, like, I don't want to make, don't make your head spin. It. You need but like one of those like... charts, like that Charlie. What was that show <laughs> yeah, called? Yeah, yeah. Him, like, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shit's crazy. Will you see this? It's just, it's, it's wild to me. It's, it's, you know, I don't know. I, I don't really want to get into it. And it's like, I'm sure we'll have comments being like, no, get into it. It's important to talk about. <laughs> but it's like, I don't know. My, my, not to say my opinion doesn't matter, but like, you know. It's no, but like, I get what you're saying. Like I, I, I found lately and it's really since I like quit talking about, you know, the scandalous things that celebrities do in their daily lives. entertainment, <laughs> daily entertainment, just draining the fuck out of me. I realized that like, there is a higher intelligence to people who can just discuss and debate ideas instead sure. of people, you know, like I find people who just either talk shit about people or only talk shit about celebrities. It's like, there's, you don't need much cognitive ability to be able to do that, to be able to form an opinion on Kim Kardashian. Like right. it's been done a trillion times, but like to speak honestly and voice your opinion and even admit that you were wrong about like an idea, you know what I mean? That's, that to me is where the real like growth and, and conversation should be, I think. And I, with the internet, at least it, there's like a subsection of people that are like kind of moving in that direction where you can listen into that and hear more of that. Whereas before it was just like whatever the TV is feeding us. Like right. I noticed how influential the TV is on my parents. Mm -hmm. if, there's an, if there's a 1-800 number, like you gotta have this new Swiffer Wet Jet thing, my mom's like making a phone call. And I'm like, that's so stupid. You're so dumb for doing that. And then I scroll through Instagram and I'm like, oh, I really like that backpack sponsored yeah. ad. Buy it. I'm like, I'm the same way, <laughs> just in yeah. a different format. That's all it is.
And I'm also finding these social media apps are pushing a lot more sponsorships now, like much more than before. And shit, like, you're be, not even following. Oh yeah. yeah, no. Like I'll literally be scrolling like through stories and then I get like a sponsored post. And I'm like, what the fuck is it? I don't follow this. I'm like, oh, it's sponsored. Scrolling through my feed, sponsored. And it's happening like a lot more that it's kind of going from social media to just like a marketplace. Like not to, you know, Facebook has a marketplace. Um, but speaking of i gotta make sure my airpods don't connect to my phone speaking <laughs> of social media apps have you guys heard of this app i literally just got it the other day called be real i've heard the name so Another it is <laughs> it's it's i'm gonna take a i'm gonna do one right now because but like literally it gives you two minutes to post in real time and that's it you got to just post what you're doing so i'm just gonna post that we're doing the podcast <laughs> But it's like, the whole point is like, it's not curated. It's not, it's just like in the moment, post right now. You have two minutes, do it. And it's like, I think that's the most awesome. You can't edit it. Like it's literally just, that's it. Wow. You just send it off, put a caption. I got to remove the location so people don't know where I live. I just flashed <laughs> it. So hopefully people didn't see that. <laughs> you need a, a blur bar on there. That was so funny in our podcast with uh, Sean when he just outed his address. I had to go back in and bleep it out. <laughs> Did he? When? He just, I don't remember that. He Before just doxed himself. One? He was telling a story about how he had like been uh, he had been in conversation with this woman over like they met on like a radio show that they would call into and they knew each other and would talk back and forth for like eleven years or something and then they finally met in oh, person. Oh yeah, his friend that visited. Yeah, and then her Airbnb was right down the street from where he lived, which was so crazy. Like, she had no idea. She just booked an Airbnb. She was coming to for a concert, and literally right on the same street. I'm like, that's wild. It was meant to be. Yeah, like, there's some real, like, universe coincidences like that that you're just like, what the hell? That's, that's insane. But when did, he, when did he say that? I remember that whole story, but when did he say that? He said that? it. He was he... like, oh, you're, I'm in this area. Like, you're literally right there. And then we all were kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What yeah, are you take doing? it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe don't so give him your address. Shit, man. Oh, he was like, funny. oh, shit. I for... He was like, I forgot what we were on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, we were it's just natural. having deep talks, man. Yeah, yeah. So about just to sort of uh, segueing from the idea of social commentary and uh, I wanted to ask, like, how did you, how long have you been a comedian? I didn't know you were a comedian. Yeah. So I've been doing it since, oh, fuck. Okay. Well, the first time I was ever on stage was the grade four talent show. Immediately. I was like, I'm going to do stand up comedy. And I told some shitty jokes that bombed hard. Nobody laughed. I think they were just like, I think they were too mature even for me to understand how to deliver them. They were just mm -hmm. like street jokes that I had heard, you know what I mean? And, uh, and then that kind of always stuck in my head. And then it wasn't until I moved away to college where I was like, oh, I'm out of my hometown. I don't know anyone here. There's nothing embarrassing about it. I always felt embarrassed to try new things because mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, it's going to get back to somebody. And then some I, people are going to be talking shit or making fun of me behind my back. I always had that like weird anxiety. So when I was finally away at college and I knew I knew no one here, I literally didn't know a single soul. I was like, let me do comedy. So that was 2011. So it's been about 10 years. Wow. Yeah. 11 wow. years. Yeah. Do you, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever shared this. I don't know if you want to share it. So I don't be on the spot, but about college, I know you told me you went to college for a specific thing. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I took police I foundations. Oh, wow. Oh, I thought That's... it was something. I thought, I thought it was something else. No, no, it was to be a cop. Oh, I don't know what I'm thinking about. <laughs> I'm sure that gives you a, a lot of material, I'm sure. It was interesting, for sure. There was just like, I felt more so, it was to kind of please my parents, because my parents were just like, I never wanted to do a normal job. Like, mm -hmm. even right at the end of high school, I was like, I'm going to be a wrestler. I'm that's what I thought. Okay, that's WWE. what I was talking about. Wrestling. And I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Didn't you go to school? I went, I, so yeah, so I, I took a year off after high school and I just told my parents like, yeah, I'm going to go to this wrestling school and I'm going to learn how I'm going to train with them in Ottawa. So it was like a, an hour or so drive from where I lived. And I was like, I'm going to train there three, three nights a week or whatever it is. I'm just getting comfy. And uh, yeah, it was so much fun. But then I was like driving home so late every single night and just like in the most excruciating pain ever. And I was 18. And I was like, I shouldn't have back pain at 18. Like that just doesn't seem normal. 
you know and i was like i don't think i'm built for this like i think i'm a fan of it but i don't think i'm built for the actual physicality of like what it means to be a wrestler like you got to do some crazy shit like if you really watch what these people are doing with their bodies you're like there's no way that doesn't hurt like it just doesn't today actually is the anniversary of the undertaker throwing mick foley off of a fucking 15 foot hell himself through a table like yeah he, he lost like, part of his ear for the entertainment of like twenty thousand. No, people like, you know? growing up we would watch it i remember they'd do like hardcore matches where they would literally like suplex each other on like thumbtacks and i'm like yeah. i get wrestling's fake but you can't fake that like they're in his body that you hurts it's sticking out of his skin you're like ah. right like that it's a real they, thing they would just literally take the bump that's what it was called they would just take like you would just take the hit basically to make the other guy like look obviously they would you know it, you could probably like i this is what i love about wrestling too is it also shows you like just how far you can take the human body right because they are in a way like expressing more pain than they're actually feeling to make it seem like even mm -hmm. crazier which makes me think like yeah it hurts but it probably feels like getting a tattoo like it's just like a pin into your arm and once you have 30 of them pinned into your arm it's the same amount of pain i imagine well, it's probably like, like they the know they're not gonna too. die like yeah right. yeah and the adrenaline for sure there's like, but i also like, like i said twenty thousand people screaming maybe you could speak on this but is it true that like when they would like bleed they would literally take a knife and like cut themselves Some is them that would, a true yeah like stone cold so, did, didn't he yeah they, they they had a cannon after that because i think he actually lost so much blood that he just passed out he like, blacked out in the match because his face was just like covered in blood. so it wasn't like 30 beers that he would drink no. every match <laughs> uh, no no so if you oh, notice like... they have like wrist wraps they have like tape wrapped yeah. around their wrist and they would tuck a blade into their wrist and they would go down like this and they would kind of just like cut a few cuts into their head and cover themselves until they got hit with something and then they would just let it burst open essentially you just pull it like this and it's you're just bleeding Oops. crazy and it's i like, think actually there was a wrestler about that no and there's a wrestler too who got aids from doing that because the guy literally cut and he didn't tell the other guy that he was hiv positive and he bled on him and he got aids like he literally and then he went ended up taking him to court and suing him for like millions of dollars i think it was crazy they were like we can't do this anymore because you don't know what the other person is like yeah wow. it's dangerous holy shit, man i know they recently cracked down on crack down on the painkillers like in the 90s early 2000s all those guys were on shit like and they talk about it like the retired guys talk about it a lot but i know now they've become much more strict so they say but even the steroids and stuff like the guys now don't look like the way they like like you know you don't see guys like batista like remember scott steiner mm -hmm. that guy <laughs> yeah, had like yeah, biceps yeah, yeah. on his bicep like that, that like, is insane you know yeah. guys like that i mean i think scott steiner still is wrestling at some capacity in some yeah. different sting is company. still wrestling he's like 63. yeah like yeah. like some of these guys man but like hogan like the, the, yeah. the veins mm -hmm. is, like they that's not natural they're on juice for sure yeah and like what now it's not as what i realized about wrestling though was the entertainment aspect it was what i liked about it it was like the big characters for sure it was like the people who could just like captivate an audience on a the crowd work right yeah the crowd work and stuff so i was just like and a lot of wrestlers are funny like a lot of them are really really funny if you listen to some of the the way they talk especially heels like the bad guys the, the creative yeah. stuff that they would come up with just to piss the crowd off like i'm like i love this like it's just so entertaining well the funny thing about that is like it's like conor mcgregor he's a real real fighter I think wrestlers are real fighters because like you said it's real like not to jump too all over the place but like logan paul did wrestlemania and he said he was sore for like three weeks after he's like i don't have these guys do it every single week he's like i did one match and i'm sore for three weeks so you know mcgregor being in the ufc and, and boxing he's a showman and that's why he's worth so much because he just brings something to it that people want to watch him either get knocked out or lose <laughs> and it's just like he just runs his mouth and it's so entertaining like the, the insults that he would throw at people, you know, sure, he went a little far, but, you know, we like that because in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't do that. So we like to see someone exactly. do that and go, oh, wow, that'd be if nice. If only his fist could back up his mouth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's got a hell of a punch. It's just, you know, ever since Habib, he kind of went downhill, I would mm -hmm. say.
Yeah, he his his rise and fall was like hard to watch because he was yeah. such a promising like fighter, and then yeah. he just just out of nowhere, he just is like taking L's, and not even that, he's just taking L's in regular life. Like he's getting yeah, messed with by old Machine man. Kelly. Like he's hitting that yeah. old guy. Like it was just so many bad things. You're just like honestly, I, I think kind it of was like. Bitch. I think it was like the story of like a, a hard work. He was like a plumber, you know, hard working came from nothing, all this money real quick. And then he probably just started doing Coke. And then he just felt like he was invincible and, and, you know, kind of lost that drive. Oh. He made all this <clears throat> money, you know, when you have the money, you're not as hungry. And, and now he's got so much that it's like, he's apparently he might fight Floyd again. They might box again. Make they both cool need the money. Million. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Was the wrestling before was before the police academy? Uh, yeah, so it was before that, and then at, kind of when I said to my parents, like, yeah, I don't think I can do this wrestling thing. They're like, are you, are you gonna go back to school or something? And I was just like, yeah, all right. <laughs> so I was like, let me go to college and get. I knew if I took police foundations, it was gonna be the a the easiest program to get into. Like, you need in grade twelve English to get into it. So I wasn't gonna be worried about getting rejected from any schools. So it was only a two year program. So I'm like, okay, I can get this done fast, appease the parents and then go do whatever the hell else I want to do. And, and like on, people like yeah. the world needs more white, white men cops. Exactly, really, right. right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I realized, dude, doing, even Fuck. doing policing. I was just like, God damn. Like I really did policing because it was, I chose that over, you know, there's so many other things that you can choose to do as a career. But the reason why I chose it was because like my aunt was in policing. I had like my, my great uncle was actually like a, uh, not Boston police chief, but he was a police chief in Massachusetts. Um, Whoa. so like big, big deal. Right. And I, I always like just kind of admired him for being able to like work up to a position like that. And I was just like, oh, this feels right. Like I, maybe I can make a difference in a community by like, you know, being part of that. And then quickly realized joining in policing, just how fast it becomes like us versus them. There would even be like a firefighter versus cop program, like hockey game. And you could see them like fucking, yeah, we're all on the same team. I'm like, you guys just had lunch together last week. Like, why are you trying to fight him on the ice? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's a departed? uniform thing. What's that? Have you seen The Departed? Yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. in The Departed, Matt Damon is uh, he's playing uh, touch football with the firemen, and you get and they I think they lose to the firemen, and they're they're mad at the firemen, saying calling them queers, and because there's there's com there's um camaraderie, but also competitiveness between the firemen and the cops. Oh, uh, that was fascinating. So it's true, Ben. What you're, what it's you're true. Saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like this huge like, yeah, we work together, but it's like a rivalry, because yeah, here's don't... the thing, because everybody's happy when the firefighters show up nobody's happy when the cops show up well, you know I what i mean so right? immediately I... it creates this split between mm -hmm. the two so it's We're... funny that you say that because i always think like like you said right there's like the fireman calendar and every, like the sexy fireman <laughs> and it's like oh cops cops are all pigs and then you just have like the emt and yeah it's yeah, like I... not even a part of the conversation it's just like no you guys you're not even a part of this. It's like rather love you the fire. You want to be doctors. You know what I mean? It's like the ambulance people are just like, go do your fucking job. Like, yeah, like, like, we don't care. We're empaths. You know what I mean? They're not even in the conversation. So I always found it very funny how it's like, because when you think of like, not government service, but when you think of whatever, whatever we would call that, you know, it's like cops, EMT and, and firefighters. But it's like, it seems like they kind of just get lost in the shuffle. I always found it very entertaining. Like even you were saying the hockey game is the fireman against the cops. Like the EMT were just yeah. there with the stretcher in case someone got hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they come after the, after everything happens sort of, right. That's sort of, I think what it is, is like the firemen are, they're running into the burning building. They're there in the middle of the action, trying to diffuse the action. I mean, so it's sort of the cops, but usually, you know, I mean, this is well, you, the, you cops know. are supposed to be preventative. They're, That's, <laughs> That's it. We're well, they prevented that one guy from breathing. Yeah, I mean, man, they do a great job of doing that. Awesome. Well, and we could also talk about, like you said, running into the fire. It's like, you know, what happened in Texas. Like, apparently the cops were, like, just waiting because they didn't want to go in. And it's like, what are you doing? You're, yeah. you're, you're, like, go in. Like, you're the ones that have the guns, right? Like, I don't understand. 
Yeah. There's this weird thing that happens, like, and it happened to me recently, actually, just with a job, like, at a much lower level, where, um, like, there's a point in your life where I think for a little bit, you are kind of reliant on other people to give you direction. But then there needs to come a time where you, and I'm saying in a work environment, where you say, like, no, I can make this decision. Like, no one else is going to make this decision. I have to make this decision. Like, right. It's, I'm not allowed to look at anyone to tell me what to do. I have to decide what to do. Like it, it's, it's just me. It's not waiting on anyone else. And I think cops have kind of lost that. They, they're just, we don't want to fuck up. Like we don't want right. to you know, be the one guy who decides that he's going to pull a hero move and run into the school. And the rest of the squad was like, we had a plan. We were going to wait for him to come out. What the fuck are you doing? You're exposing this mission right now. But I think there needs to be more cops like that who are just like, fuck protocol like let's just be a human right now right well i think uh, okay i'm speaking way out of line here but uh i heard that cops aren't that well trained compared to other <laughs> just in, in, in regards to like um when you talk about like navy seals or marines or whatever else there is like they said like cops are uh it doesn't in times of crisis like actual crisis they're not the they're not the most well trained at running towards the gunfire as well as they should be, all things considered. Yeah, here's what I would say to that. I don't think anyone could be trained enough for that job. But I don't think it's a job that humans should have in the first place. I agree. Like anyone that gets put in that situation, like here's something that totally blew my mind. Um, this staff sergeant that's with like a SWAT team where he was like, we, we kind of volunteered where the police were actually running like a mock school shooting. And they used, they had like an abandoned old school that they had purchased for the purposes of training their police on, on school shootings, literally. And they said like, it happens so often, but you only hear about the ones in the news where people like actually get shot. But there's school shootings called in like almost every single day. And it's, it's, it's just insane. And he was saying like, to his sergeants, he was like, what would you, how hard would you train if you knew that there was going to be a gun for sure at the next call you went to? Like, they would be like, oh, I'd train so hard. I'd train every day. You know, I'd like practice. I'd go to the range and I'd practice shooting and I would, you know, go to a martial arts class and make sure that I could do, you know, whatever. And he's like, every call you go to, there's a gun there. You have one on your waist. At any point in time, someone could just reach over and decide that they're going to grab that. And now there's a gun in play. And I was like, damn, that is so fucking true. So I couldn't imagine like go pulling up. You've, you've been called to save the day. Somebody is having the worst day of their life. You don't call the police unless you're having the worst day of your life. And then they show up, guns blazing, cars comes flying in, the adrenaline's rushing, they have a gun on their hip and they see commotion and they just make split decisions. Humans aren't meant to right. do that. That's that's a robot thing. Like a human couldn't possibly make that decision. And everybody's always like, why didn't you shoot him in the leg? It's like, have you ever shot anything under pressure? You don't really get to pick where, where you're shooting a gun. Like it, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't, you can't just aim at the leg and then decide I'm going to shoot at the leg. It could hit something in ricochet. It could yeah. like, miss, it could misfire. It could anything, any number of things could happen. Yeah. It could jam, yeah. There's there's so many variables to it. Um, and like you said, with the adrenaline, you're not thinking, you know, someone has a weapon coming towards you. You're not thinking, okay, uh, where's the, yeah. like, let me let me really think about it. Like, you don't have the time to think. I don't like to drive a moat when I'm emotional. I couldn't imagine holding a gun. Yeah. No, <laughs> like, sure. what? Yeah. I agree. And but like, I ahead. think, sorry, I just, I think, I think film and TV has also really, uh, I don't want to say curated, oh, yeah. but uh, it makes people think. Yeah, it makes people think that like the perfect shot, like like everyone has the perfect shot. Like, yeah, I it's always the bad it. guy has the hostage, and they're like, "I'm gonna kill them," and they make a perfect yeah. shot in their right head, in the and head. it's like, it's "Oh, like, they're saying no, <laughs> that would not happen." Like, <laughs> I remember a cop telling me, um, "He's like, if someone ever pulls a gun on you, just run in zigzags because the odds of them actually hitting you is like slim to none." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh." Oh, okay. Yeah, like, I remember hearing that. Right? Maybe like, like point blank to actually right? hit your so, target. So it's like, I, I always thought, you know, not always thought, but I always thought it's like not that hard, but it's like, you know, like running in zigzags probably can't hit you. But it's like, oh, well, okay. 
<laughs> so I, I read a David Goggins book and just what I've read from that book, uh, the Stay buzz hard. training. Yeah. What it was called, <laughs> right? Uh, no, for, it can't hurt me, but he just says stay oh. hard every other chat, every other word, actually. Well, just with the buds training, like a big part of it is uh, hardening off the emotions of fear under pressure. It's like like when they would continually drown them, so they would black out underwater or force yep. them to do push-ups with the tide rolling over them. It's to like you become because when you get tortured enough, you sort of just become numb to the physical pain. It's more the emotional pain that breaks people, like uh, wrestlers, <laughs> right? It's true. There you go. There's a callback. So, and not to say like all all police should be trained like that, but I mean. It's just, it's, I don't know, it's, a, it's, it's too nuanced, I guess. There's no answer. There's no answer. It's and just, it's, and it's like people are different too, right? Like it, everybody would take that training in a different way. Like I find the majority of cops are either people that were bullied in school. And so they're trying to reclaim that power or they were the bullies in school and they want to continue that power. And right. those two sets of people working together on a team is a disaster. You have nobody that's thinking rationally. You have people that are basing their identity as a cop on their insecurities in a way, well you know? So try telling them that they need to do a better job or go to this training. They're just going to feel insecure and then be an asshole just to the next person they pull over for speeding, you know? And it's like, why is this cop so fucking agitated right now? Well, right. his boss probably told him that he was going to get fired if he didn't meet quota. That's probably what ha what's happening. Right. Like, it's... It's, it's a stressful job that nobody should be able to do. I certainly agree with that. I mean, it, yeah, I agree. It's it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. It's, and that's a problem is a lot of these things are more nuanced than people give credit to, but they, 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 they they're thinking about it. And when I refer to them or they, I'm talking about uh, just the, uh, the people that you read online, whenever a situation like this happens, it's very black and white thinking. It, there's, they don't take nuance into account. And how could you though? Like on the internet, right, right. the internet has no room for nuance. Like it's right. 140 characters. Yeah, yeah. It's just always extremes. The second I see always. a Facebook post that's like, I have to hit read more. I'm like, oh God, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> like, but I shouldn't feel that. I should be like, oh, I wonder what deep thought this person is going to go right. into, you know? Yeah. There's a lot here to say. Pig fucker 97 wrote like a, a manifesto, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so I first want to ask, January how much shit. Taco Bell do you have to eat for them to give you a t-shirt? <laughs> All right. So funny story. Um, I was constipated one day and I just decided, you know, laxatives weren't it. <laughs> I shit all over my shirt. And this is all they had. <laughs> you know, I just, I decided to get Taco Bell and I shit my pants and they said, don't worry, it happens often. Here's a new set of clothes. <laughs> I actually, I think I got this from the black market with, uh, with an ex-girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, I thrifted for a little bit, which I actually kind of like, you know, I don't, I don't say I like thrifting. I, I like older clothes. I like nineties shit. So this seems like very 90s to me. So that's why I like it. I haven't worn it for a very long time, but I had to put on a shirt for the podcast because I realized uh, Magic Mike starts at 10, 10 p.m. So I got 10 more minutes of the shirt and then the after party starts. You save that for, for <laughs> the, the, the OnlyFans. For the OnlyFans, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> is that the name of your OnlyFans, Magic Mike? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it's not, not a bad idea. <laughs> so That's another thing that's ruining <laughs> society. Magic Mike, Channing Tatum, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that movie is where the downfall started. For those of you who keep your track at home. I actually, um, I actually like the movie, it was funny. Yeah, oh, it was Deck McConaughey very, at his Deck best. very funny. Uh -huh. right. it no, very but it's, it's, the, it's like the fact that so many people are very brazen with like, I made this X amount of money doing Y. And so every yeah. person, every man, woman, and child is like, I want to do that. And yeah. nobody wants to, I don't know, like work at the car garage or, or to become a plumber yeah. or like jobs that we need to hold society together. Everyone wants to be like a pop star or fucking. Which, what I don't understand is like with the amount of. Or a podcast. With, with, audacity. <laughs> with the amount of free content online, the fact that like people still make hundreds of thousands of millions for OnlyFans, I'm like, I get it. It's like amateur to the max, but like you could just go to Google and type in amateur and, and, and still get real amateur stuff. Like it, it's the maybe it's knowing the, idea, the though. person though. Yeah. I think that's what it is. It's like, Oh, I, yeah. I know this person. Now I get to see this side of them. This is so scandalous. And it's like, I don't know. 
like like imagine the most if part, OnlyFans you know, was around when you were like in like fucking I don't know like in high school and you found out that like one of your teachers had an OnlyFans right that would be no, fucking 100%. insane that honestly insane. thinking back my grade five teacher was smoking and if I was twelve or like eleven however old I was in grade five hundred yeah. percent I would take a credit card and and and, and fire that. <laughs> <laughs> that's my point though is just like it's just like slowly becoming that like i feel like we're in this weird transitionary period where everything's about to get a whole lot weirder like we're gonna have like massive job shortages but people also complaining that they can't find work and it's like there's tons of jobs every yeah, you business just don't i go do into it says available. we're hiring you just nobody yeah. just wants to do it true Oh, well, and that's another thing, right? With like content creation, you can make dumb videos on TikTok and, and make $10,000 a post, you know? Fucking nuts. So uh, I'm, I would love to, I, I'm trying to do that now. <laughs> but I have the excuse, I'm an actor. I like, I'm an entertainer. <laughs> so I could use that excuse. If I'm looking down, it's just because I'm rolling a joint, but I'm still listening. No, so, yeah, so, so you're, uh, you want to so you left the police academy to become a comedian? Yeah, well, I finished it because I didn't, and one thing I'm not, I'm not a quitter. I don't like fucking starting something and then not doing it. So he's going to finish rolling that joint. <laughs> I'm going to finish rolling this joint. <laughs> no, I quit. So it was my first year in college. I found out, I was like trying to make friends. So I was following like all the local like college campus pages and stuff and like going to the community boards to try to find out like what was going on. And I saw this thing that said like, um, oh, it was like a comedy competition or something. Like, are you the funniest person on campus? And the winner got to open for like Sugar Sammy. So I was like, okay, that's really cool. Like I know who Sugar Sammy is, that'd be dope. And so I thought like, okay, well, I need to make a video and stuff to do this. And then I made the video and like passed it around and got up. I think I came second actually in the competition because I went door to door in my dorm and knocked on it and was like, hey, my name is Johnny. I live like right down there. I'm in this comedy competition. Do you want to just like go on Facebook and just like give it a like so I can like do the show? And they're like, yeah, that's future, cool. Future Prime Minister met, of like, Canada all here. These, <laughs> yeah, I met like all these really cool people just going door to door in my like dorm room, just telling people like that I was in this comedy thing. And then I did a bunch of shows and I was like, man, I really like this. But then in my head, I was still like, it seemed like so far away. Like it didn't, I wanted it to all happen right now. And it, what I knew deep down that it wasn't going to happen that way. So I was like, what can happen right now and what's more stable is if I just become a cop. So I actually, for three years after school, I like tried to become a cop. Like I, that's all I focused on. And then out of the blue, nowhere, like out of nowhere, I get this email from a lady who I took the program with and she used to plan all of the MTV, like mu video music awards, or whatever, the much music video awards. And she was like, Hey, I remember you did comedy in college. Are you still doing that? This like show is looking for a new host. You should apply. And I was like, Oh, sick. So I went to Toronto and did a show and taped it and sent it into them. And then after I did that show, I was like, oh that is such a good feeling like getting laughs for stuff i wrote and getting off stage and then i kind of just told my parents like hey i don't i don't want to do the cop thing anymore like i need i need to do this like i it's not want to like i need to do this it's just like a feeling that i can't just ignore so then i just focused on that like i tried i gave it a good effort to try to like become a cop and i even like got i had an interview i was supposed to actually go it was weird the way it happened. I had passed the interview. All I had left to do was the psychological testing, which I'm not insane, so I knew I would have passed it. Like, you know, I'm a pretty reasonable person. I don't when think was the there's test? any like red that flags ago, that are going right? on. <laughs> yeah, this was years ago. I've lost my mind now. <laughs> I mean, all the mushrooms, <laughs> all those mushrooms are just, I'm a different person now. But back then, no. and then I, yeah, so I get this email like, come in this time to do a psychological evaluation. I knew that as soon as I passed that, I was gonna get sent out to a training facility, probably in like Edmonton or something. And I was gonna actually be working at like a correctional facility, like a brand new prison that they were opening there. And I was like, man, do I wanna move to fucking Alberta and be a prison guard? 
And then I got this email that's like, or do you want to audition to be a comedy show host? And I was like, yeah, that. I want to do that so much more than, than the other thing. Wow, so that's... Just, yeah, stuck with it. Do, do you have a uh, comedic influences that you tried that you like sort of uh, used as a launching point for how to find your voice? Oh yeah, so a lot of, I mean, it's interesting because I took little bits of everybody. Like I think Robin Williams live on Broadway was probably my first big influence of like, no, I knew him from the movies. So then watching him just do stand up and he was like doing all these dirty jokes and like, it was crazy. I was like 11 years old and I was like, wow, this is like fucking wild. So I always love like his energy and act outs. And then I remember obviously like Dane Cook was like a massive influence, like just the shit, like we would just download on LimeWire, like his bits and just like play his bits over. And, and then we'd go on car rides and my friends would like get me to like recite bits. Cause I just knew it. I knew the, his cadence. I knew his timing. I knew his voice. I could do like Kool-Aid man. I could do like any of these Burger King, any of these huge bits. Um, and then, so his voice was really something like that. I was like, okay, I want to apply his voice to things. And then on, then I found George Carlin and George Carlin was really like, oh my, my God, like this guy can talk. It just feels like he's just talking about mm -hmm. like really stuff that needs to be talked about. And like, you can tell that he's passionate about it and he's doing it in such an eloquent way that you're like laughing and learning at the same time which is when I started to try to like always layer my jokes so that when you listen to the joke, you're getting something new from it every time that you listen to it. Uh, yeah, it's, that's a good analysis. George Carlin was uh, sort of like an updated Lenny Bruce, very, um, yeah, he's political and he was like, he was almost like a philosopher that used humor as his vehicle. Exactly. Yeah. He was fascinating. I never, I always, I always, uh, I didn't, I know of him. I know his work. He's very clever. I never listened to him as much as I listened to like Don Rickles. I see in the background, like he's one of my yeah, favorites, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, you can't not respect the art of, of uh, Carlin, the way he presented it and his brilliant brilliance as a, a writer. And it's fascinating. So uh, it's interesting that you went to, like from Dane Cook to George Carlin. Cause in my opinion, you're like two polar opposites yeah, just yeah, as far yeah. as. <laughs> yeah. Dane What's fascinating about Dane Cook is I believe like he was the first guy to fill these gigantic stadiums like before even like the, the guys like Don Rickles and they were it was more of an intimate setting when they would perform but Dane Cook was filling Madison Square Garden like three nights in a like, row. The comedy yeah. album went like double platinum like it's he insane. like he did like insane numbers and and I really like took notice of that and kind of studied him a lot actually like I found out that he did a lot of Canadian tours because the arenas were super cheap to rent out. So he could make like a bunch of money by just renting out like a little arena in Canada and then like packing it with like 30,000 people. And even if the shows were like half sold out, he could say that he did this arena. Right. And so that kind of gave him credit when he came over and did more arenas in America or went abroad and did more places. Well, so um, you know, a lot of physical comedy though I found with him. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's like, like his, big hands his and bread and, and butter. He's just like very yeah. performative, um, with his act outs. But I mean, like I love that silliness. Like, and I also love the guys who don't even like Tom Segura doesn't take the he rarely at least does, takes the mic out of the mic stand. He kind of just stands right. behind it and talks. Well, like Ari him. Ari Shapiro too, and and Mark Norman. Like I I like through Lauren. Uh, you know, I mean, I know Ari Shapiro is the amazing racist years ago, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. but, um, but, uh, like we, we were fortunate enough to see him. What was it, like October, 2019, 2018, yeah, about a year or two and ago. just like his comedy was just so, like, again, not very physical, just him talking, but it almost like, seems like he's just telling a story for the first time. Like he's your friend. It's very intimate, but he's mm -hmm. so funny. I find Ari, um, but again, polar opposite, like Kevin Hart is very physical performative theatric and then you have like someone like george carlin who's not as over the top right so just different types of comedy i guess i found george was like a nice mix like he <clears throat> there's a period in his life where he did do like a lot of expressions with his face like he was very like had a lot of facial expressions and it it like 
it was essentially the music to the lyrics. Like it was like the beat that kind of kept you locked into the story that he was telling. It, it was like you were sitting in a bus stop and you had to wait an hour for your bus and there was this crazy guy and you didn't Old care guy. that he had to wait an hour because he was just like, and then did this happen? And then, yeah. can you believe? and you're just like, oh, wow. <laughs> but you love every moment of it. You know, you're just like, this is, this is crazy, but I love the, what's going on right now. What's fascinating about Carlin is he was so tight, his act. It was like every, every word had meaning if there's no filler it felt like no. like he really polished he was like a really strong writer and he didn't do open mics really wow didn't, i didn't know that like, from what i know he would write out i could be wrong but from what i know he would write out his whole hour like the hour of material that he was going to do and then he would smoke a bit of weed and go back and punch it up like oh, he's an animal he can make it funnier good lord and then he would go and record an HBO special, <laughs> like, like what? And it would come out clean. Like, I'm sure he practiced in his hotel room a bunch of times. And I'm sure he booked like the odd club gig and did like, you know, 30 minutes here, 40 minutes here. But I don't really recall him being like doing a circuit of shows. He always seemed to just be doing like really big theater shows or like recording an HBO special and again it, it could be like what we were saying earlier where like we only know what he put out maybe he never talked about doing those shows or never put out anything from those shows so we just assume that he never did them there do you know uh, who David Tell is yeah I love David Tell David Skanks Tell. from Memories <laughs> he's he <laughs> is one of the goats in my opinion <laughs> But uh, he, I, I believe, uh, I could be wrong, but I believe like he, as good as he is, he's still always doing uh, open mics, always showing up at the Comedy Cellar yeah. continuously. Like he, he's like the best, I can't get any better than that, in my opinion. Yeah. He's still, I guess he has the mentality that like, as soon as you stop sharpening the sword, you get a little dull. <laughs> well, I, I mean, like, like, do you know, sorry, go ahead, Jared, I'll tell you. I was going to say like in LA, I always see uh, at the comedy bar, like Chappelle, Bill Burr, they randomly just show up just to work obviously rogan like joey diaz like these guys that sell out stadiums just do not free shows but how much was the comedy bar when you went like 20 bucks dude uh comedy store it was like comedy store. 20 bucks and if you went after 11 it was free so i would just go every night after 11 for free and watch i watched Gerard carmichael bomb in the like not the main room but it was like the belly room bomb he was still getting laughs but like <laughs> He, he had a notebook, like he went on stage with a big notebook and set it on the stool and he would like look at him and be like, all right, what do I want to do here? Okay. Yeah. And then he goes, how about this? And then he would just say some shit and I'm like, <laughs> what's happening? This guy's on HBO, like what the fuck? What am I watching yeah. right now? This is so, but I'm like, I guess he has to do it. Like uh, otherwise, like that doesn't make any sense, right? Like how do you get, how do you get good without practice really? And that's exactly it. But sorry, what were you going to say before I interrupted rudely? um well i lost my train of thought. sitting here it like was... it's like it's my podcast uh, it is your podcast bro <laughs> <laughs> it's okay i'm your first guest <laughs> so i, I wish saw... I should... go ahead. yeah go ahead go ahead no go ahead. please I'll, I'll i'll find it i'll find it while you're talking <laughs> something i've noticed at least in my opinion is there's like there's a division between east coast and west coast comics um not that like there's a division amongst each other but just from my experience or what i've seen a lot of the uh, west coast guys are a little bit more uh, physical sort of like uh, i guess like kevin hart's style of humor joe rogan versus the east coast guys from the uh, the comedy store are more just like sort of stand there just like rapid fire jokes very lyrical not so uh, they don't act out as much from what i've seen at least mm -hmm. and i much prefer personally like the uh the east coast guys like the like louis ck's the jerry yeah. seinfeld's there's just something look i maybe this is my ignorant take but uh i feel like when you're acting it out it's like it's you're sort of or cursing a lot you're sort of cheating not cheating but like it sort of feels like that because if you can just make people break down with just your words yeah. just clever wordplay like that's that's hard that's really hard yeah but i i call, I call it comedy with no legs when it's only act outs like if you can take away the act outs and the words are still funny, I say add in the act outs because like it's it's like teaching to a, a class. You don't know how the audience learns, basically. Are they visual okay. learners? Are they oral? Are, do they need to watch someone do it? Like you don't you have no idea. They just need to see a video and they'll get it like you have to 
I think formulate your own voice and like really inject your own attitude. Like, are you just, don't put it on. Like I, I would hate to see a guy who's like super physical on stage and then very like meek off stage. Like, no, I want you to be that big personality also off stage. Like you should just be an extension of that on stage. But like, I think it can add to it. It can take away from it if the words aren't there. That's why you have to start with the words. And then it was the same thing with my music. I was like, I know I don't have the best voice. That's fine. I know I don't even know how to really edit music. I have no idea. I've never taken a course. I've never done any of that. But I know that if the words are undeniable and it's like, and it sounds good, at least to me, somebody else will enjoy it as well, you know? And then that, that again is even an afterthought as well. But I always go back to like what you said, start with the words, like the, the words on their own have to be able to hold up on a piece of paper, right? Like if you can read my joke and still laugh at it, then it's funny. Right. Fair. That's good. That's a good perspective. What kind of, if you had to uh, put your comedy in a box, what, what would you say it, your act is like? Mm, fuck. That's something I've been struggling with too. Is that like, Finding, you're still finding your voice is that what it is yeah yeah i would say i'm still finding it because i'm only like 11 years in that's a baby in in the comedy world really like i know what my voice is in terms of like how i want to sound on stage which was the point that i uh, was going to say earlier was you know that you've really made an impact when all of the new comedians want to sound like you which yes. is what happened to Dave Attell. Everybody started to talk like this. They all started to deliver <laughs> around the same. Like, and even Dane Cook, people were getting all of a sudden really physical with their humor. And then you yeah. had a thousand Dane Cooks. So I'm like, damn, like, I, I don't want to get that, but I want to, how do I get to that level where it's like my style is unmistakable and other people have recognized it in me, but I have yet to recognize it in myself. Like I remember uh, a friend of mine came up to like, I. I had just done my set and he was in the green room and I came into the green room and I guess he thought that I had just got to the show and he goes, Johnny, you're not going to believe this. There was some guy on stage doing your jokes. And I was like, dude, that was me. I was literally just <laughs> on stage. And he goes, Oh Christ. And here I was thinking, he goes, I heard the punchline. And I was like, that's a Johnny bit. And I was like, Oh, well, that's cool that you can recognize like just right. the words. Right. And he, he literally wonderful. thought it was another person, yeah. but I was like, damn, like I find that, I, and I'm trying to actually write in like a thing called a runner line, like Ronnie Dangerfield had like, I don't get any respect or I get no respect. That was like his runner line. I really think that a lot of my humor revolves around the audacity, just the audacity of everyone. I just, that's always where I arrive. Like the audacity that someone would say that to me, the audacity that this person would say that in the first place, the audacity of this idea that people thought would work. Like I just apply that attitude of being like offended in my own way by and disgusted almost by like what I'm witnessing and even what I see in myself. So I don't know how you really like categorize like what that is kind of sarcastic observationist. You know, that was that was a really thoughtful answer. Something you said though that really stuck out to me is you said eleven years as a baby, which I think yeah. is. But that's okay. So this is how you know he's legit, Jared, because there are people that have been at this for like six months and they're already like putting out YouTube specials and stuff, and and it's just <laughs> it's it's bombing harder than Syria right now, and yeah, it's yeah, and it's yeah. horrid. Jesus Christ! <laughs> it's but my point is like for him to say eleven years is still a yeah. baby. Like that's someone that's serious. And then one last thing, and I'll I'll shut up. For you to say that you can't really uh, put it in a box and like it just everything you're saying is like, you just seem so passionate about it and so uh, it seems like and this is how this is how I think that sort of seems like we came to the same place without saying it I feel like voices are found just by continually doing it and sort of just happens organically you can't really say what it is you just sort of know no. it when it happens I kind of think of it like in terms of um, like chipping away at a giant cement block mm -hmm. and you're trying to build a sculpture and every day you you chip a little more in one direction and you chip a little more in another direction you're like mm, you look you stand back and you look at it you're like no something doesn't look right and you just keep fucking hammering away at this block until finally when you're dead and gone people go 
wow, what a legend. Look at what he made. Look at this Look thing. At this you know what I mean? But the person who actually made that statue probably never thought that about themselves. They probably thought right. it could use a little more work. Or maybe yeah. I'd try again on it. But maybe they also find in that time, like, oh, I like the style and the way that I did these things, so I'm going to keep doing it. And what I find is the hardest thing is to separate what I enjoy about my voice and what others enjoy about my voice, because those two things are very different. And the last thing that I want to do is hear someone say, because we all do this, if someone says to you, like, wow, Jared, you're a really good runner, you're going to be running every single day. You're going to go every day running right. because you're like, so-and-so said I'm a really great runner. It gives you that confidence to be like, I, I should do this. Yeah, I have potential right. in this. I've and gotten like, permission, yeah. Yeah, you need your own direction. Permission is the best way, best way to describe it. Yeah. You have to give yourself permission, basically. So what you're saying, just to reiterate, is that you are going to do what you think is right, yeah. what you think works. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because as soon as you start catering, you're dead in the water. Oh, well, and then like we just talked about that, the sides flipping. What if you if you pick a side, let's say you yeah. want to be a political comedian, and then your side changes their perspective, you got to change with them. You notice how all of these Trump guys also became anti-vaxxers? That's not by coincidence. The va the base changed, and right. so they had right. to change what they were talking about. They yeah. don't probably actually believe these things but they're stuck they've boxed themselves into this well, category the same of thing fans with the Roe versus wade thing right it's, it's like yeah. all of a sudden they're all in my opinion they're all stout that. christians that, yeah, that are so pro-life all of a sudden it's like well, you, guys, well, you guys aren't religious fuck you chair like but it's just you know they're drinking the kool-aid man That's yeah it. and it's the it's the it becomes sad because it's like man you've really boxed yourself into this corner where it's like it would be weird if you just flipped to another side and Boxing it would be really down. hard probably to rebuild that fan base. But like saying I'm 10, 11 years in, I always look at it in terms of like your age in comedy. So 11 years in, I'm basically an 11 year old on stage. Like right. once I'm, 20, once it, I'm 20 years in, I'm, I'm, I have a probably fully, like I have a decent voice. I kind of know what I'm doing. I'm still a little like adolescent, but like there's people that are like 30, 40 years old. That's a grown ass man or a grown woman on the stage yeah. like, that's talking. They know what the fuck they're talking about. They've been through it. They've had three divorces and they fucking toured the country. It's like, they know they have opinions, you yeah. know? No, it's, it's the battle scars that, that build up the story and the, the help you find the voice. And like, I always, uh, you only get to, you only get somewhere by writing a bunch of shitty stuff first or like writing a bunch of shitty music, a bunch of shitty story, whatever it is that you're writing. Once you have like 30 shit pages, then you can actually start maybe finding where you're going <laughs> with the idea. Well, it's like I anything, right? When you right start here. your shit, like it's, that's just how it is. Everyone starts iceberg. off yeah yeah everyone starts off as an amateur the pros well, at one point was an amateur right so you, you got to kind of like you said the battle stars i'm sorry johnny you're saying you have i have a quote right on my note where i pin all my notes and stuff that from is from ernest hemingway and it says the first draft of anything is shit <laughs> it's, it's true though right and it always true, makes though. me laugh because <laughs> i'll get writer's block it's very scary looking at like an empty page and being like all right let's come up with something it's like it doesn't work that way you have to just like start writing and I, I i heard this somewhere too about like how your comedy brain or your creative side of your brain doesn't even really click in until like 40 minutes 40 minutes of doing that activity whether it's writing or, or whatever it is that creative side of your brain where you can really get in that flow state and start to have fun doesn't really hit till like you've do, been doing it for 40 minutes and focusing on that topic that's why Louis C.K. even, he has a computer that has no internet access. It's like an old computer where it's just wow. the notepad that works on it. So he, because he knows himself, he knows I'll get distracted. I'll start Googling stuff and then I'll forgot that I was even writing something. And it's like, get damn. carried away. Like, Next thing yeah, he knows, exactly. jerking off in front of someone. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. calling, calling somebody on the phone to jerk <laughs> off with them. Um, yeah, he is, in my opinion, of, of these new guys, well, I know he's a bit of an older generation, but like he's, He's like, in my opinion, like David Tell level. He's so brilliant. He's so clever. Mm -hmm. I love, I love him so much. Not to compare, but just like I think his level of brilliance, his originality is is so unbelievably creative. Well, I want oh, to give man. a quick shout out to what is this Gary Vitter? Vider is that his name? This guy? Oh yeah, um, Vitter. Gary Vitter. 
Uh, Johnny, Johnny, I already heard him. My, my, my brother sent me this clip of him talking. And just the joke he said, he's like, I want to start a Jewish gang. Because he's like, no one is afraid of Jews. You know, when you're walking the street with your buddy, you see a guy with a yarmulke, you're like, you know, let's cross the street. He goes, you don't say that. And he goes, like, I want to start a Jewish gang. But he's like, we're going to do something different, you know. We're going to come to you and be like, give me all your money. I'll show you how to make more with that money. <laughs> it's, and it's I just brilliant. thought... I don't hey, want to know hey, that. Hey. Show me how you control the weather. <laughs> <laughs> With that thing on your head. But he does so well on social media because they control the media, the Jews. Right. Right. Yeah, so right. that's why he's yeah. so good at it. So. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Goddamn Jews control everything. <laughs> so where do you perform now? Um, mostly in Ottawa because like. Is that, where you're, is that where you live right now? Yeah. Yeah. So I moved to Ottawa. Um, I have a show, like I said, July 13th at Yuck Yucks. If people live in Ottawa that are listening to this, definitely come out to that. Um, it's, it's tricky because it's not the comedy scene that I was used to. And at the same time, I'm at this like weird point where I'm like, just trying to focus on experience. There was so long that I did nothing but comedy and it kind of melted my brain a little bit. Like, um, I, everything had to be a bit, I couldn't like go through a conversation without trying to like mine the conversation or filter it to find out, okay, how do I turn this into something funny? Not even for the conversation for me to tell later that night on stage. And so I was never really present. I was always in my comedy brain thinking about like, how to, where's the premise? How do I add a punchline? Oh, that's funny. Write it down. Like just constantly telling myself that. And it got to a point where like I was getting robbed in China at like three o'clock in the morning and like very scary situation. And my instincts were not there. My instincts were like, man, I hope I get five minutes out of this. Like that, Jeez. I hope I, I hope I, I hope I live to turn this into a story. Yeah. This would probably make me a lot of money. That it was where my worse. brain was. Then the guy steals your joke too. That would just yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I write it down. He's like, give me that. <laughs> he oh does. He gets God. a Netflix special. He goes. So I was robbing this white guy in China <laughs> at three in the morning. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I'd be so mad. I'd be like, oh fuck, that was my bit. Um, that anything else that you wanna you wanna plug? I know you're doing this show. Anything else that I mean, you have a podcast, obviously. Yeah, make sure you check out the Johnny Rogers show every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern. We're making it like church. You got to show up every Sunday at 7 <laughs> o'clock. <laughs> Tune in for Johnny late night. And people come in those colorful suits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, got the, you got the preacher. You got the, the organ player. <laughs> da, 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 da. I would love to have a late night show, but like it would have to be like a long, long, long form podcast, not like traditional late night. 35 right, right. minutes <laughs> just 45 minutes of hanging out with a band and a guest yeah okay so you have a show uh you said july you said yeah july 13th at yuck yucks when's this coming out uh, uh tuesday a week uh today's wednesday today's tuesday right yeah, yeah so next so tuesday, july, july, yeah, next july tuesday. so july, july 5th. 5th. there you go i'm glad you know how to use a calendar because i sure as hell don't uh, yeah. <laughs> i just pulled up the calendar there too <laughs> me too i uh, pulled it up really quickly yeah Cool. Is there yeah, any... You can also follow me on social media at the Johnny Rogers. That's what all your links down any, below. Any future. Oh yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Got you, we'll post this to Instagram and everything else. I really appreciate you being on the show. Like this was an experiment, but uh, I, th I, it went better than I was expecting. Not that I the thought you would thought yeah. this, but just you know, hey. who the hell knows. Awesome. Yeah. You, you really never know when you have a guest on, you're like, I don't know what there's, there's some people too that I've had on as guests where I'm like, Oh, I don't think you've ever been on a podcast before. It's like yeah. pulling teeth a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Like you ask a question and then you get an answer and then it's like, that's it. <laughs> Dead air. I'm yeah. like, I don't have another question. I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> well, you've been great. I'm, I, I cannot wait to uh, see how the show uh, goes that you're like on the show i, I saw some of your go. clips and they were amazing i can't i mean if anyone's listening at all i can't uh encourage people enough to check it out because you seriously are brilliant it's it's unbelievable Thanks, to see someone it's, at your age already like so insightful it's uh it's fascinating before you go i am curious do you live stream the show ever like do you just have like a camera like a phone set up instagram live anything like is that a thing no so what i do is i i pre-record it edit the podcast to my liking and then i air it as live so I like just premiere every episode at Sunday at seven. So you, you can watch it as if it's live. So there's no like skipping around. You have to kind of like stay in for the full thing. But I've actually thought about like going over to Twitch and finding a way that I can like 
recorded on Zoom while also streaming the raw version on Twitch so that people can tune in earlier. But I'm trying to yes. figure out like what the, cause I know I also post the audio to my Patreon page so that people can listen to it ahead of time as well if they want to for like a buck 50 a month, uh, patreon.com backslash the Johnny Rogers. If you want to <laughs> just shameless plugs in here. No, that's what it's for. That's what <laughs> if you want to catch that. Yeah. Um, I didn't but yeah, you maybe, maybe I'll do a Twitch. Twitch your stand up. I meant, I meant like your stand up. Did you do oh, my stand up? Cause like people no. are in Ottawa, but they still want to see it, man. How, how could, you know, I you know, know sometimes you post it on Instagram. You post yeah, I'll post it. I had an idea that because I was kind of going through all of the videos that I have. I have videos all the way back to like 2014. I didn't record anything before that. And I was like, I had this thought of just put uploading to YouTube every single set that yeah. I did, even the bad ones, like the yeah. ones where the audio is shitty. I'm bombing, like there's no laughs. Like, and it would be mostly the same material just getting worked on. But I'm like, I wonder like what the best platform is to do something like that and how you Netflix, like package probably. it. <laughs> yeah, probably Netflix, right? Air my first set in 2014. But I'm like, would it be YouTube where you could just like click on this playlist and just watch all the way back from yeah. like 2014? Well, because I, I think right people, idea. you know, like the Kanye documentary, when you see him kind of up and coming to what he's become now, it's like people like the idea of, not the idea, but seeing the progress, you know, because everyone sees the final product of like, celebrity and and you know they're yeah. a big star now but it's like what was their journey like because yeah. everyone's has a journey and for a lot of people it's inspiring man so i think it'd be a great idea but again you know whatever uh whatever floats your boat there but just wanted to see if people could somehow see the show if not in ottawa you know well if not check out my youtube page because maybe that'll happen i'll just get a there moment of spontaneity where it is that fuck it i'm gonna upload all of this <laughs> we'll YouTube. do it live <laughs> Well, all we'll the links will be down in the description. If you're listening or watching, yeah, yeah. you can click them and find everything for uh, Johnny. I want to thank oh, you yeah. so much for coming on. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah, it was great meeting you, Lauren. Thank Take you so much, guys, for Likewise. having me on. This is truly a fun time. I really appreciate you having me on as your first guest. Honored. Yeah. All right, we'll check out the Johnny Rogers show, and uh, we'll catch you guys next time. By the way, in case you don't realize, we've gone how, – how long is it? Like an hour and a bit? uh yeah it's like 10 23 so we started at like nine so what like an hour almost and a half yeah we, we paid yeah. for zoom guys after many episodes of saying we're gonna do it we finally did it so here it is oh, we, caved. Caved. we caved because it's perma. i guess it's, we're stuck now it's permanent right you can't go back now <laughs>